we are recording. You can see the screen? Yep. All right. Uh, just a minute, I want to... Mm, okay. So, hi everyone and welcome to this seminar. I won't say good evening because for some of you, this might be a different time zone. My name is Siddharth and I'm going to talk about drops and bubbles on chip. But before I do that, I would like to give a, a super short summary of my scientific journey. So I did my PhD from University of Basel, where I studied actin dynamics, uh, networks of actin, uh, yeah, dynamics of actin networks. Uh, and then I came to Netherlands in the lab of K.S. Decker to do a postdoc. And there I got introduced to this wonderful world of synthetic biology. And since last year, I am an assistant professor at Wageningen University, where I am leading my own lab. And let me just. And while I have worked on different topics, I would say one common thread has always been uh, biological systems. So and looking at them in a in a very interdisciplinary fashion. So let me give a quick overview of today's talk. First of all, as you all know, it's part of the Build a Cell seminar series, and I really want to thank Kate for giving me the opportunity to, to talk here, but also for just organizing this whole thing. I think she has done a really, really fabulous job. Uh, this is also the last talk of 2020, so a bit special. And this is going to be, I mean, I want to keep it relatively short. It's a 35 minute seminar and we will follow it with questions. All right, so what exactly will I talk about? Uh, of course, I'm going to talk about synthetic cells. Uh, but more specifically, I want to tell you a story of how you can use microfluidics to make hybrid containers using membranes and membraneless condensates, which can be used to build synthetic cells. But let me start by taking a moment to appreciate how incredibly complex living cells are. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite videos I took during my PhD. And it shows something that most of the cells are capable of doing, that is growth and division. Now, of course, this is a physical manifestation of, the, of, of plethora of biochemical processes happening inside the cells. Uh, and indeed, it is very difficult to pinpoint cause-effect relationships in such complex living beings. And that's why I like the notion of synthetic cells a lot. Can we take the individual components and build synthetic entities that can mimic some of the, some of the vital characteristics of, uh, of life in short. Can we build life from scratch? Now, if you want to build synthetic cells, how would you begin? Which container could you choose to, uh, which container could you choose to, to, to start building your synthetic cell? Uh, and there are different types. And I would like to quickly give you an overview of that. For example, you can think of taking using vesicles like liposomes, or fatty acid vesicles, polymerosomes. You can think of droplets and colloidosomes, which come into the category of emulsions. Or you can look at membraneless condensates, for example, formed through coacervates. And in this talk, I want, to, I want to show you how you can combine vesicles with condensates to form hybrid functional containers. So from different types of vesicles, we chose liposomes as our cell-like containers. Liposomes, the boundary of liposomes is made up of lipids and lipids are amphiphilic molecules. That means they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic, hydrophobic two tails. And in an aqueous solution, they can self-assemble to form a three-dimensional enclosed lipid bilayer, which we call a liposome. 
And here is a nice video of a fluctuating liposome. And you can already see that the membrane is very flexible even at room temperature. Now, how can you make liposomes in a controller? And this is where I want to introduce to you. I genuinely think microfluidics is a very powerful tool to study biology. Uh, and one of the ways to microfabricate things is using soft lithography, which is very much like a printing process. What you do basically is you take a silicon wafer and on that you coat a photoresist, which can polymerize in presence of light. And in this way, you can write your pattern on the wafer, develop it so that the unpolymerized things go away. And then you get your design on the wafer as, and we call it, call it a master. Now you can use this master to cure a rubber-like material over it called PDMS. You can peel it off, punch holes in it, bond it to a glass. You have your microfluidic device. And here is such a, here is a typical Labonet chip device. It's just a few centimeters in length, and you can even see the, see the channels here through which the fluids flow. So almost everything that I'm going to show you here on is, is done in such microfluidic chips. All right, so inspired by previous methods, we developed our own method to make liposomes on chip. And this is how it looks like. It's really a bubble blowing process, but on a micro scale. So what we have is three different channels. We have the inner aqueous channel in which you encapsulate everything that you want to put inside your liposome. Then you have the lipid carrying organic phase, which is basically lipids dissolved in one octanol. And then you have the octanol, uh, then you have the outer aqueous phase, which really pinches off these two phases to form what you call double emulsions. And you can see as soon as these double emulsions form, this solvent octanol, along with all the excess lipids, go to one side to form a pocket. And a lipid bilayer starts assembling at the interface between the inner aqueous and outer aqueous. And as, it, and as these double emulsions go down, uh, downstream, the pockets keep on protruding. And at one point, the pocket simply gets separated to form a liposome. And this happens within minutes. We call our method octanol assisted liposome assembly in short OLA. And this can result in a rapid formation of cell sized monodispersed liposomes with high throughput up to 7,500 Hertz. Now I want to show you a few key characteristics of OLA. First thing is, since it's an on-chip production, it offers excellent encapsulation, meaning the inner aqueous phase is completely separated from the outer aqueous phase. And this is why the, the, the contents of the inner aqueous phase are totally isolated from the outer aqueous and you can nicely encapsulate them inside. So what I'm showing you here is the lipid phase in slow motion and the corresponding inner aqueous phase, where you see all the inner contents getting encapsulated in these liposomes. And I think this is very crucial if you want to maintain the right stoichiometry of complex mixture of components. Another thing is the form liposomes are unilamellar, meaning they have only a single lipid bilayer as the boundary. You can check this using membrane proteins that get inserted only in a single bilayer, for example, alpha amylysin. So when we insert alpha amylysin in the membrane, the fluorescent dye that is encapsulated quickly leaks out within a few minutes. If you do not have alpha amylysin, the fluorescent dye just remains encapsulated which really shows that the membrane is unilaminar. You can do this in another way using dithionate bleaching assay. So if you make your liposome using NBD lipids, which are fluorescent and add dithionate outside, this dithionate cannot pass across the membrane and only bleaches the outer leaflet. So if it's a unilaminar liposome, the fluorescence should basically reduce by a factor of two. And this is exactly what you see here. Over time, once the diethanate is added, you get uh, the, the, the fluorescence is reduced to half of the original value, which shows that indeed these liposomes are unilaminar. And the third thing is the lipid composition is tunable and maintained, meaning the composition of the lipids 
that you put in the organic phase is what you get in the liposomes in the end. So if you put uh, here, uh, I show you an example of a binary mixture of PCPE lipids. And here the PE lipids are fluorescent labeled. And as you increase the proportion of the PE lipids, you get increased membrane fluorescence. You can see that nicely in this graph as well, where another binary mixture is taken of PGPC. And as you increase the fluorescent uh, labeled PC lipids, there is a linear increase in the fluorescence of the liposome. So in short, OLA gives you unilamellar monodispersed liposome with an excellent encapsulation efficiency and tunable lipid composition. And indeed, we have used OLA in a versatile manner. And I want to just give two different examples before we co go further. So one thing we used was we, we, we used the OLA-based liposomes to, and microfluidics to perform mechanical division of liposomes. What you see in this video is liposomes getting divided by a mechanical splitter into two equal sized liposomes within milliseconds without almost any leakage. Uh, and this is the aspect of synthetic biology that I really like that sometimes there is no biological counterpart, but it, these things are still interesting from, from a synthetic biology point of view, for example, making an artificial life cycle of vesicles. You can also use the liposomes for developing high throughput drug screening assays as shown here, for example, where the liposomes are trapped in physical traps. And uh, here we are showing the, the membranolytic activity of a polypeptide antibiotic over time as the liposomes uh, burst over time. So you can really go into the applied direction as well. All right, so we have a sea of liposomes to play with, but what we were really bothered with was our liposomes didn't have any compartmentalization and cells are extensively compartmentalized. Uh, as you all know, cells have lots of membrane bound organelles like nucleus, vacuole, mitochondria, chloroplasts, endoplasmic reticulum, but this is not it. Over the last decade, we also know that cells have membrane less compartments. And I'm showing you a striking video here of the carbon dioxide fixing pyrenoids, which are actually membraneless organelles. And they maintain their identity in the cell, but also undergo dynamics, de novo formation, division. And indeed, there are tens of membraneless condensates. This is how they are called nowadays uh, inside cells. And they're very much crucial for maintaining the cell, for organizing the intracellular biochemistry. And they play different roles right from cell signaling to photosynthesis, from endocytosis to cell differentiation. And this condensation can also be systematically, systematically studied in vitro uh, using model systems. For example, if you take oppositely charged multivalent molecules like ATP and polylysine, they can undergo a process called complex conservation and form condensates. I show you a video here where I basically mixed ADP with polylysine and it does not form anything, but as you add pyruvate kinase, which converts ADP to ATP, and then it has enough negative charges, it forms this nice little condensates on a glass cover slip where these bright, uh, bright droplets have high concentration of these polyelectrolytes, while the dilute phase has very low concentration of it. But what we, but we are not interested in doing things on a cover slip, what we really want to do is, can we form condensates inside our liposomes in a controlled manner? And indeed we did that using two different strategies and this is what I will show you now. Uh, the first strategy was using transmembrane transport. So indeed using the, the alpha ML as in pores to bring about transport of small molecules inside. And the other strategy was using actually just the natural permeability of membranes to bring about a pH triggered condensation. So let's start with the first strategy, making liposomes porous. So as I said before, what we did was encapsulated one component inside our liposome, here polylysine, the, the large component, and we had the alpha amylysin pores at the membrane, and ATP, which is a small enough molecule to go to this pores, was added outside. And the idea was, once ATP goes inside, it can form a condensate. And this is what uh, the video is going to show, 
the polylacin is fluorescently labeled and is green the membrane is red and once i start the video and add atp see what happens you get this beautiful condensation inside the liposomes and ultimately all these small condensates come together to form one single condensate which is freely diffusing into the liposome so this is the before after pictures before you have a homogenized homogeneous interior afterwards each liposome has one single condensate uh, so we can really form condensates in a controlled manner and you see the intermediate time frames uh, for this for this video one key characteristic of these condensates or liquid droplets is they fuse together and you can see that uh, in this time lapse here as well moreover you can control the size of these condensates so it doesn't matter how much atp you put outside the size is dictated by how much polylacin you put inside if you put less you will get a smaller condensate if you put more you will get a bigger condensate you can also see that nicely in this volume against uh, the polylacin concentration graph where you see a linear relationship between the two uh, we also made the scheme a bit more complex by having uh, an enzyme catalyst condensation within these liposomes so what we did was encapsulated pnps which is an enzyme that takes a seed rna and uh, polymerizes into a long single stranded rna and by encapsulating pnps and also having spermin which can condense it with uh, rna and providing udp from outside we could bring about this enzyme catalyzed condensation and you can see that here in this video uh, where again a similar process takes place once you add udp from outside you get this beautiful condensation inside the liposomes all right so we can use pores to induce condensation but can we do without the pores can we make the scheme even more simpler and indeed we can where you can we can take advantage of uh, the fact that the condensation is ph dependent so for example let's take a look at atp at much lower ph atp doesn't have any charges only at neutral or higher ph it gains up to four negative charges and indeed at lower ph polylacin and atp does not do not form condensates it's only at the neutral ph or it's within a range of ph it they can form condensates also at higher ph uh, the condensation is not very effective because now the polylacin is not very effectively charged so we wanted to use this this ph trigger as as a as a clue uh, yeah as, as a trigger for condensation but we first wanted to check if the liposomes themselves can respond to these changes in ph nicely so for that we encapsulated a fluorescent tokyo green uh, a ph a ph responsive fluorescent dye called tokyo green inside the liposomes and the idea was as we uh, increase the ph we should see a fluorescent uh, a rise in fluorescence inside the liposomes and let me just directly show you a movie and when i add uh, when i increase the ph you see this beautiful green glow coming from inside the liposomes you also see this green flash at the start but that's because there is some tokyo green outside as well the main thing here is this green glow of liposomes uh, and this is how it looks in uh, in terms of numbers you can basically increase the ph by few units within few minutes so that's really uh, that's really a good time scale so ph triggered condensation now we have these hundreds of liposomes this is one of my favorite movies by the way uh, they are all at ph4 and they have polylacin and atp inside and they have they show no condensation and once i increase the ph outside you get this condensation process happening across all the liposomes and each of them get one single condensate you can also see it in a zoom in here and the process looks very similar to that with the with the transport uh, mechanism so basically we can use two different strategies to form condensates inside liposomes uh, that's very nice but what can you do with this so i want to show you a few functionalities of 
such condensate compartments. So one thing that we did was to sequester different things, for example, lipids in the form of small unilamellar vesicles or proteins like FTSZ. Uh, and the idea here is by sequestering them, you make them unavailable for the rest of the, for the rest of the cytoplasm, so as to say, or only available at, make it available at a particular spot where the condensate is. And you can also use these condensates as reaction hubs. So we, as a proof of principle, use beta galactosidase, which converts FDG into a fluorescent product, fluorescein. As you can see here in the images, at the start, you don't see any fluorescence, but after two hours of incubation, uh, you see basically a strong fluorescence coming from the condensate, uh, suggesting that it is acting as a reaction hub for this particular reaction. Now we were inspired by some recent evidences that the condensate membrane interactions are also very vital. And you can see this beautifully in this, uh, in this video where the tight junction proteins are themselves phase separating at the cell membrane. Uh, so we were wondering how we can make a bottom up model system to study such condensate membrane interactions. How can we do this in a, in a, in a simple manner? So we started with uh, inter ele electrostatic attraction between membrane and condensate. We know from zeta potential measurements that our polylysin ATP condensates are a little bit positively charged. And normally they are nice ready fusing inside the liposome. But what if we make our membrane a little bit negatively charged? Would then they stick to the membrane? Let's have a look. So again, this is a pH triggered uh, condensation process. And you can see that as soon as these condensates form throughout the lumen, once they touch the membrane, they just stay there. So this is very different. This looks very different from how uh, it was in the previous videos. You can see it a bit better here that the nucleation starts everywhere, but once the condensates touch the membrane, they just stay there. They just even keep on growing. And uh, those that are out of focus are basically not at the membrane, suggesting that they are either at the top or the bottom membrane of the liposome. Things become even more clear when you compare that with pure DOPC membrane, where uh, you can see in the heat map that the, the, the distribution of the condensates is really in the center and over time and for the, for the doped liposomes, you get nice localization at the membrane. So electrostatic attractions work. Some can something else uh, work as well. And we thought about using hydrophobic interactions. So, you, so we use the same system of RNA spermine as I showed before, but this time we tagged RNA with cholesterol. And cholesterol is a lipid that happily goes to the membrane. So what we had was liposomes filled with this cholesterol polyurna and spermine now at pH 13. So you can also do the pH trick the other way around. It doesn't have to be always going from low to high. It can also go from high to low. And when we lower the pH, something really interesting happens. The condensation really starts at the membrane. And now these condensates are not really spherical as before, but they are completely splashed onto the membrane. They are wetting the membrane. You can see that here again uh, in two examples that the condensates are really kind of flattened at the membrane. Uh, and I like to show this, uh, what I call sunset chymographs, which show the angular distribution of fluorescence over time. Uh, and you can see that at the start, you have a homogeneous fluorescence, but once the condensation is triggered, you get this multiple trails, which very quickly uh, merge into a single trail. And the same thing happens here uh, in these beautiful sunset chymographs. So the condensates wet the membrane, but we observed another interesting thing. And that was this condensate patches when the liposomes were kind of uh, in contact with each other, they kind of glued these liposomes together. Uh, it kind of suggests that there might be some kind of a transmembrane interaction with it, but we are not very sure about it. And uh, this could be a interesting thing to explore further. 
another interesting observation was at these condensate patches the lipid fluorescence increased meaning the lipids were kind of accumulating at these condensates uh, and in fact at a few uh, we we caught a few examples where just when the condensation occurred we saw a decrease an abrupt decrease in the liposome radius uh, and that kind of suggests that this condensation might be affecting the local membrane structure uh, so this could be something really interesting uh, happening here and we would like to explore it further so in short we can vary the degree of coarse-red membrane affinities from no interaction at all to electrostatic and to hydrophobic where it is even more tightly bound to the membrane and you can think of it as an increase in the interaction strength where you have uh, just the spherical condensate side of the membrane and then partial weighting and then full weighting all right so i would like to summarize here i i hope i showed you that microbiology is a really powerful tool to uh, to 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 do control experimentation and we sh I, i showed you how you can use ola to to make liposomes and condensation i think is a is an interesting thing from the context of synthetic cells for organizing the the uh, the synthetic cell interior and could be really a powerful uh, a powerful tool and in fact you can combine these two things together to form condensate in liposome structures uh in a in a very controlled manner and going further you can also induce interactions between these two materials uh to to form some interesting uh, uh hybrid structures so most of these things were basically done uh, at delft and i really want to thank case for you know for his constant support and enthusiasm uh i also want to mention few of my students who were involved in this work so mart ensen frank uh, and kasper were uh, did some really uh, useful work and now i am at wakeningen in the department of physical chemistry and soft matter uh, where i have uh, i'm i'm leading my own lab and that's uh, that's really fun and challenging and what are we really interested in there so i want to continue with my microbiotic approach but i want to understand more about cellular morphogenesis and look at the interplay between of the cytoskeleton with membranes and also with condensates i think that's a really interesting direction to go to we're also slowly trying to develop uh, some scheme for developing for for biosensors using uh, soft matter soft matter based materials and we'll see how that goes so this is our newly launched launched embosis lab we like to study emergent biological systems uh, these are the two awesome guys that are working with me right now ketan is a phd and larry is a postdoc and we are slowly uh, getting increasing number of bachelor master students uh, who want to work with us and just in time we got some nice funding from nvo so that means we have a fully funded four year phd position so if you are interested in this kind of things uh do get in touch with me so with this i really want to thank you all and uh, want to wish you happy holidays uh, and uh, best of luck for 2021 as a small gift from me to you i think i see these as deconstructed christmas trees where the tree is basically encapsulated within the within the decorations So thank you and I'm ready to take any questions you might be having. Thank you so much that was awesome. Okay great. I I don't You have a lot of you. you have a lot of questions in chat. Okay okay. I will have a look. Uh, I think you might need to exit the presentation mode. Most no, people I can have see it actually. I can see. Oh you it. can okay great. All right. Let's go to the start. when you do phospholipid liposomes in pdms how do you prevent them from sticking to the pdms yeah excellent question i i did not talk about it because uh, it was a bit too technical so the way you do it is uh uh inherently pdms is hydrophobic so that means of course you cannot 
you cannot possibly do this double emulsion production because the octanol will just wet the membrane. So what we do is we do a partial surface treatment where we uh, basically coat the post-production junction with polyvinyl alcohol. And that makes basically that part hydrophilic and then you can do the uh, production. I can maybe also show it here. Here. So everything uh, from the production junction onwards is coated with hy uh, hydrophilic uh, polyvinyl alcohol and then the liposomes won't stick. I think that's that's clear. Uh, I will go to the next one. Thank you. Could you do condensates within the range of pH that's compatible with TXTL, so transcription, translation machinery. Uh, yeah, I think so, because I mean, the condensates, for example, with polylacin ATP, the condensation form happens at pH 7, which is, I think, compatible with TXTL. But probably you are asking if the TXTL machinery is still viable after, uh, you know, is it still viable at pH 4 or so. Uh, I don't know. It will, it, 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 it's an interesting thing to basically see i it could work and you can also probably uh decrease this range over which condensation happens by adding some more salt and things like that so that's also tunable so i think uh, instead of you know maybe you don't have to go so low with the ph but maybe just from five to seven could also work next question wouldn't polylysin based condensates sequester cations and make TXTL impossible. Uh, I'm not exactly sure about this question. So you're saying polylysin based condensates will sequester cations. I mean, so it's a condensate made up of polylysin, which is positively charged and ATP, which is negatively charged. So there are both charges present. In our condensates, uh, so our condensates, condensates are a little bit positively charged, but uh, I'm sure you can also tune that. Uh, yeah. So if I guess I'm not answering this question properly, but maybe please. Uh, if whoever if, asked if, that question would like to unmute yourself and clarify, that would be helpful. Or you can also just type it in the chat if you don't want to. I mean, that's also fine. I can have a look at it later. Maybe I go further. OK, I will go further. So when condensation happens inside liposomes, does it change the osmolarity of the liposomes? Nice one. So. I wouldn't say so. So I, I'm thinking from, uh, I'm looking at the pH trigger one, okay? Because that's simpler to understand. So sure, the now, uh, now these now this counter ions are together, but you're also releasing the, the, the counter ions for each of these, right? So I think ultimately the osmolarity doesn't change that much because these are the polyelectrolytes and uh, their, their counter ions are already there in the solution. So. I, mean, I don't think the osmolarity changes too much. And we would have seen that actually in terms of the liposome shape. You know, if the osmolarity changes too much, the liposomes would have uh, made some weird shapes. So I don't think the osmolarity changes too much. Okay, next one. Have you ever observed membrane bending when you induce condensation at the membrane? Uh, no, but this is a very interesting question because I think these kind of things have been observed just using condensate, right? Uh, I think, so in our case, we always kept the, the conditions isotonic, meaning the osmolarity inside and outside is exactly the same. And I think perhaps with tuning the osmolarity, this could be, uh, we could have, we could observe some something more some some more membrane fluctuations and so on but also for the condensate to
pull on the membrane, you have to have something pulling on the condensate from the cytoplasm side. And for uh, in our case, in, in, in these simple experiments, there are the liposome is in a ways, in a sense, a bit more empty, right? There's nothing, nothing else in it. Okay, next one. Wondering if you have thought of using OLA system to understand more of membrane constriction, which leads to the final pinching off of vesicles. Might be a really robust system to look at proteins like dynamic. <laughs> Oh man! So I, I this is this is I, I'm laughing because I, during my first year of postdoc with Case, I I was like, okay, let's use something like Dynamin, and we had even started. We had even thought of collaborating with uh, some Dynamin people, but it never really happened. But yeah, this could really be uh, something something really nice to uh, to look at how Dynamin can constrict uh, membrane. But that will be from outside, I would say. But yes, I did thought of it, but did not really do anything about it. Okay. Another one. Could you use this method for more origins and astrobiology studies to make vesicles with fatty acids instead of phospholipids? Absolutely. So indeed, we can make, uh, we have made uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid vesicles where it's 50% fatty acids, so like oleic acid and 50% uh, uh, lipids, like DOPC. That works. For some reason, we cannot make pure fatty acid vesicles because the octanol pocket does not really separate. Uh, that's my experimental observation, but there might be some tweaking involved and then you can, you know, even make pure fatty acid vesicles. So yeah, definitely it's possible. And indeed we have made hybrid vesicles and use them to grow them actually. Uh, I did not show that work here. Okay, so the previous question is back. I was asking about coacervate sequestering any cations or anions, depending on the coacervate pH, charge, maybe you want to say. If you have coacervate that's, for example, capable of sequestering ATP, that would deplete TXTL ATP, right? I'm trying to figure out if this could be organelles for synthetic cells that has metabolism. Uh, yeah, I think I think this is an interesting idea, but you have to realize that the it's not like the coacervate is sequestering ATP. I mean, in a way, it in a way it is, but the coacervate itself is made up of ATP. But you're right. If you have the if you now have the TXTL components sequestered inside, they would use the ATP. And that could uh, uh, that could lead to some some dynamics, or that could make them act as an organelle or so. Definitely possible. Nice thought. Thanks a lot. I think uh, yeah. Did I, did I go too fast? <laughs> If there are no more questions, um, I think you basically gave a second talk answering the questions um, on top of your original talk. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, I, I love this work. Um, I would love to be able to put some of our um, TXTL genetic circuits inside those droplets, especially that would if you- be super interesting, yeah. Yeah, you know, especially with a membrane, if you can make uh, liposomes in that system and then make some sort of a coacervat with it or maybe next to it and if we can do some sort of a communication between those liposomes this those kind of lifelike functions could really be um, very powerful yeah we should we should talk about it i would love to and you know one day we'll travel again so <laughs> we can actually one meet. day we'll meet in person yes <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions. Um, oh, go ahead, someone had a question. Um, um, yeah, how, how well does this microfluidic setup deal with the, let's say, viscous solvents? Because I mean, you're probably using octanol because it's quite fluid-like, no? But then if you're going for like mineral oils or something, I think, I don't think it probably would respond so well. I, mean, I don't know, I'm not a microfluidic expert, but. So, uh, so you no, know, you can you can definitely use mineralogies and uh, these things. We are also doing that for different different reasons. And 
So we use octalan for another reason, not because it's less viscous, but you can absolutely use mineral oils. Uh, it again depends on the dimensions of your channels as well, but yeah, you can do that. So viscosity is not really a big issue. Great, thanks. Okay, any more questions? If there's no more questions, um, thank you very much and thanks everyone for- Thanks a lot, Kate. That was uh, really nice. I really love talks with a lot of microfluidics <laughs> and microscopy because they're just so beautiful. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Science is fascinating always, but the, the pretty pictures <laughs> do <laughs> pretty a pictures lot. <laughs> Right, right. All right. Have a safe, healthy holidays and new year. And thank you so much. And yes. see you all next year. All right. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye.